The following podcast is a W2M Network original production. Visit W2Mnet.com for all of our other great podcasts, plus news, reviews, articles, and opinions from the worlds of wrestling, video games, football, and entertainment. Human centipede. And that's our show, everybody. (laughs) (laughs) Welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to the kickoff here on the W2M Network. I am your host. My name is Harry Broadhurst. Thank you for joining us. Good evening, afternoon, whenever you're listening, everybody. It is the divisional round episode of the kickoff here. Joining me as per usual, the Down Since Day One co-host turned executive producer, Brandon Biscabing. Apparently, this is the human centipede edition. The executive producer turned co-host, Derek Watkins. You know, I was perfect. Family (laughs) shot! All I was going to say was I was perfectly lined up for a damn good bird box challenge joke before all this human centipede talk. <laughs> Losing my damn appetite for these delicious Tostitos. I guess he's doing it for the corn chips this week. Anywho. And the fourth man, the chairman of the W2M network, Jason Teasley. The head of the centipede has spoken. Do you see what you started? <laughs> We're not going to have a network to come back to next year. <laughs> well, that may actually be true. <laughs> but that's, that's a whole different story. <laughs> yeah. That's debatable. <laughs> we may be sticking around. It's time for studs and duds. Eric, start us off. Well... While normally it takes two people to make a touchdown pass work, the quarterback and the receiver. While I would give credit to the quarterback in these situations, my stud, which I predicted would have to be the guy to step up for his team, is none other than the man who caught what would be the game-winning touchdown pass, Golden Tate. Right in corner of the end zone, perfect positioning. Yes, they didn't make the two-point conversion, but thanks to a double doink at the end of the game, there was no club dub at Soldier Field. Club dub is closed until 2019. Golden Tate, thank you for proving me right, making me look good, and helping salvage my weekend betting-wise. On a related on a related note, there is no confirmation to the rumors that Matt Bourne and Steve Lombardi were in the stadium that day. That is a wrestling joke that like six people will get. <laughs> and frankly, if those six people get it, it's worth it for me. Jason Stud. My stud is the Clifton Tigers football team who dismantled that quote unquote SEC powerhouse known as Alabama. Nick Saban had to rush back to campus and take the keys to the Camaros and the Chargers away from players before they was found out. Brandon? Clemson put an ass whooping on Alabama. (laughs) You cannot deny that. I am 100% not going to deny that, but I'm also not going to jump on board with this whole SEC is overrated bullshit that everybody keeps spinning nah, out nah, of No, I'm not. No, nah, I'll give Alabama their props. Alabama was not overrated this year. They it, beat those Catholic schools to death. Like, like I've said before, and I'll talk about this a lot more later on, but... SEC is to football what the Big East is to ba- or at least the old Big East was to basketball. Enough said. Brandon Stud. My stud for the week is Marlon Mack. 184 yards, a touchdown. Normally in a regular season game, not the biggest of numbers, but he was Definitely a big factor to the Colts' win against the Texans this weekend in the wild card game. And a lot of people, especially with the rumors going around that the Colts are looking at getting Le'Veon Bell and all that, 
A lot of people were talking that this is a breakout game for Mac, and it is something that, hey, the te- the Colts don't necessarily need Bell at this point. Man, I wouldn't be touching Le'Veon Bell with a 10-foot pole at this point. Oh, if oh I was- neither would I. Thank you for finally coming to the side of reason, Harry. I said all along I wouldn't want somebody like Bell on my team. If but you said, but you, but at the same time, you also said that there would be plenty of teams oh, that there, would be uh, looking at him. Allow me to preface what I just said. There, there will be plenty of teams that will look at him. My team would not have been one of them. Oh yes, they would. Well, yeah, they would. You're missing my point, Brandon. If I, I were the general manager yes, for yes. I would not be going after Le'Veon Bell because he's already proven that he has no commitment. Agreed. He has no dedication. His heart is not in football. His heart but, is in the money yes, that comes but, from professional football. But that's what I've been saying all along is that the only teams that are going to actually look at him are the teams that do not have solid front offices. So basically he's going to end up in Jacksonville. Hi, Eric. Yep. I was well, but they about... already have a good running back, so he's safe. No, no, we're not safe. I don't trust this front office's decisions. And if Marlon Mack having a return to form so good, Mark Morrison would be proud. Yeah, the Jaguars would easily hand the Le'Veon Bell the keys to a Brinks truck and say, hey, you look good in black. Fournette's hurt. Come on down. All right, I'm going to have to do this just because he brought it up here. And apologies to anybody's earbuds who I insult here. Oh, come on. Yeah. Okay, I'm good. Uh, I'm going to break some news. Uh, Just simply because I can. Um, Arizona let go of Byron Leftwich. He is now going to be the offense coordinator for the Bucks under Bruce Arians. Oh, dear Christ. Yep. Yeah, it'll still continue. Another former Jaguar who within the next five years is going to get a ring. Fantastic. <laughs> Great. Technically speaking, I guess it kind of makes sense that Leftwich would work with Winston. They were very similar, and they're they're very similar in their styles. Mm-hmm. Well, not to mention under Bruce Arians as a head coach, who was a head coach in Arizona, it makes fantastic sense. All right, my stud for the week up until the fourth quarter was the Los Angeles Chargers defense, and the fact that they gave up two garbage touchdowns at the end of that game really should not distract you from. The fact that Lamar Jackson had arguably his worst performance as the starting quarterback for the Baltimore Ravens. I said going into this game that the Chargers were going to be looking for revenge. And this Chargers defense, I believe, what was the number we heard, Eric, at halftime? Something like negative seven yards of offense for the Ravens? Especially as like negative two passing yards? Just absolute domination by the San Diego Charger front seven and the secondary keeping the receivers for Baltimore in check. Yeah, I don't have, know who the San Diego Chargers are. The Los Angeles Chargers. That, I knew I was going to do that at least once today, so at least I got it out of the way early. What, you completely throw me off, Ernie. Okay, back to what I was saying about the Chargers here. Lamar Jackson with his performance there. You could hear the chance for Flacco in the stadium with the performance that Jackson had up until the garbage time touchdowns that Jackson took that team on. This is Lamar Jackson's team now, but this could be a sign that maybe it shouldn't be yet. Well, that's why even I was one of the first ones to admit they drafted him in the first round for strategy contract-wise. But I was looking at that game, and I even said to my mom, down 17, or mom, A, if Flacco does come in, the Chargers are immediately going to use a game plan for a traditional passing offense, and the Ravens would be screwed. And I also said, if he doesn't come in, we would never see him as a Raven again. I still stand firm to that one. If Flacco would have went in that game, he would have got murdered. Oh, I'm I, not... completely, I completely agree with that. Don't get me wrong. They had a game plan specifically for a Lamar Jackson-led running style similar to wing T offense, which they had to develop after they first played them a few weeks ago. 
you put in now a traditional quarterback who's a bit of a statue, oh, yeah, those edge rushers would have just teed off. I'm yeah, not yeah, denying Bosa, that, but... They would have just turned Bosa to kill... They would have turned Bosa into, like, murder mode, and, like, Flacco would have got broken half. Okay, whose dog is trying to make an appearance tonight? That would be Wilfred, but like I was about to say, um, Flacco... <laughs> it, while I agree with you guys with Flacco... I think the issue, or not so much the issue, but the thing that I was very surprised about was that they didn't uh, go with Flacco at any point after they were getting absolutely slaughtered. So this is definitely a sign that they have moved on from Flacco and that this is Lamar Jackson's team. Well, I think what Eric said there kind of sums it up there. If Flacco didn't get into this game, then his time as a Raven is done. And oh, absolutely. I think I think there are plenty of suitors out there for Joe Flacco in the free agent market mm-hmm. or for him for him to be used as trade bait, assuming what his contractual situation is like in Baltimore right now, which I do not have in front of me. Let's flip the other side here. Let's go to our duds. Eric, you lead us off. Well, while, while Jason was singing Clemson's praises, I picked Clemson to win. I knew that it was going to be at least a somewhat higher scoring game. As I kept saying throughout the first quarter, overbetters are loving this. But, um, that Alabama defense, granted, not all 44 were at the hands of Trevor Lawrence, who executives in the NFL would be gushing and saying if he could come out right now, he would be the number one overall pick. But 44 is still 44. Did that defense even try? After halftime, I mean, that was just pathetic. Never saw the likes of that before from any Nick Saban team. Fun story here, and I actually saw this on ESPN after watching, after uh, seeing the highlights from the game and stuff. Did you know that Clemson handed Nick Saban his worst loss since Buffalo beat Miami by 21 in 2006? Mm-hmm. Yeah, I, I've seen that. Never been ne- yeah. in all of his time at Alabama. Never been worse than fourteen. That's crazy. I saw that. I saw that on ESPN, and like it blew my mind. Mm-hmm. J- Jason Dud. Uh, to piggyback on Eric's Dud, he went Alabama's defense. I'm going to go to the man that led Alabama's offense. A Tua Matata, as I call him, who inexperience and immaturity showed uh, against a tough Clemson defense. Um, uh, he had he yardage wise, he did decent. He threw like two eighty seven or something, but his yards yards were had dipped significantly, significantly against a team that is not. Uh, headed by two blind mice, uh, and he just made a lot of throws that were were basically highlight reel throws, as I'll call them. And he was trying to be a gunslinger when he wasn't. He forced a lot of passes, and that's why I think he's about that. I think he's going to be a amazing pro when he comes out. But I still need, I think he still needs to face more premier defenses than he had this year. Two things. One, I assume this means you're no longer going to call him Maui Waui. And two, imagine what the competition is going to be like with his brother coming in. Well, I want to kind of touch on something here as well with the fact <laughs> that Jalen, apparently there are rumors going around that Jalen Hurts has officially entered the transfer pool. So yes. it's it's going to be Tago Valoa's team going forward there. I don't think they're, they're going to start his brother, even though the rumors are his brother's even better than he is. That being said, I think a loss like this actually helps T- Tago Valoa in the long run because he had yet to experience defeat as a college quarterback, and this gives him an opportunity to have to learn what it's like to come back from something where, let's be frankly honest here, Clemson kicked Alabama's ass on Monday night. 
Well, he just lives up to his moniker, Akuna Matata. <laughs> okay, so if I see him come out holding a lion cub, I'm done. <laughs> okay, so side note here, just because this pissed me off. Have you guys ever actually seen the translated lyrics for that song? No. No. There goes a lion. Oh yes, it's a lion. <laughs> <laughs> Are you freaking kidding me? All that and that, that, well, I mean, if you think about it, sometimes you can't peek behind the curtain. That's like everybody loved Gangnam Style. Horse dance, crazy South Korean celebrity appearances and everything. But if you actually listen to the lyrics and you translate them, it is extremely subversive and takes all kinds of shots at the South Korean 1%. That's why I love it, but not everybody's me. <laughs> I feel violated having that information in my head now. Brandon, <laughs> God. Um, and I will preface this by saying, yes, I know they, they changed it to a block and everything. Um, and I'm not going to put all the blame on him, but Jake Elliott and the remainder. <laughs> kicker. What? Elliott kicks for the Eagles. Coach Cody Parkey. kicks for the Chicago Bears. Who was it? Cody Just Parkey. Go to the Co- oh, Cody Parkey. Correct. I, I don't the kicker for the Eagles. Yes, you're They're right. Advancing. You're You're right. You're right. So Cody Parkey and the rest of the Bears offensive line and and the rest of the Bears special teams for completely botching this and thus allowing the Eagles to block it and have it sail wide to the left. Uh, Incorrect again. Actually, we can blame Pepsi. (laughs) Why? (laughs) Did you see the edited video with uh, Parky's Miss edited into it? It's pretty funny. Oh, God. No, I have not seen that yet. I think that's what Jason's referring to, and it's pretty funny. And again, yeah. if someone hadn't have mentioned the human centipede, that would have been part of my bird box challenge joke for my <laughs> intro. There we go! Anywho. But yes, so it's a it, it's game on the line, and you completely botch it. Yes, I know it's hard to do. Yes, I know. I don't know if you guys saw Goose Island co- basically come to his defense and say, you know, we're going to set up a pair of goalposts, and anyone can come and try to make this kick, and, you know, if they get free beer for a year. Um, but, yeah. You're a pro NFL kicker. This is one that should be makeable. See, I'm going to actually go the opposite route here, and I'm going to give credit to uh, Doug Peterson for using the ice to kicker strategy. And successfully oh, no. Pull- that, that's definitely a warranted strategy that works sometimes. Well, well I must, uh, for one bright side, I do give Cody Parkey some credit. He finally completed the game of three bar. Because <laughs> it was the opposite. For those playing along at home, Cody Parkey was my dud earlier in the season for doinking four different kicks off the right go- upright in a game against the Lions earlier this season. All what? together, six doinks. A couple off the left upright, <laughs> one off the right upright, and then this one not to outdo himself, left, upright, and crossbar. Oh, God, it's even worse than the Survivor Series. <laughs> Harry? What What was really funny was the announcers showing the YouTube videos of Parky back when he was in high school, and he would go out to random places and find poles and kick and hit the poles in the open <laughs> parking lot. And they had just showed that right before he missed the kick. 
Hashtag foreshadowing. Maybe, maybe he should have been focusing on kicking away from the poles instead of kicking towards it. Maybe that's his. That was his problem. But then, if that I, happened, then we would have been denied the Spanish call. Have you ever heard two Latino men oh sing God. Chicago on oh. live on the air? It's a very beautiful thing. Oh God, I can only imagine. And and by the way, Harry, I'm very disappointing. I, I'm very disappointed at you no selling my uh, doink reference there. Oh, that was a four doink. That was doinks on a mission, I believe. Yeah, I know. I said it's even worse than Survivor Series where there were four doinks because now there are six. Well, technically speaking, there were four doinks at two different. Never mind. Moving <laughs> on. <laughs> my dud for the week are college football playoff fans. Because between Alabama storming out 28 nothing on Oklahoma, Clemson bitch-slapping Notre Dame, and then Clemson absolutely dropping a hammer on uh, Alabama in the championship game, you got a grand total of zero games worth watching in this year's college football playoff. Congratulations, guys. Well, hey, you saw the way to early top 25. We're right on track to see... Alabama and Clemson wrap up their best of five series next year. I mean, th- it, you, you get what you pay for, which is absolutely nothing. And, you know, you, you, you get what you deserve because no one, you know, has any sense to change anything. So, you know, what do you expect? Yeah, this is what happens when ESPN pays over a billion dollars for things. NFL wildcard games. College football playoff. They're going to learn their lesson at some point. And this is when you oh. basically have the NBA 2.0. Go ahead, Jason. What were you about to say? I was going to say I highly doubt they learn any lesson. You're probably right. I mean, I'm a big proponent of the college football playoff. I think it could be a wonderful thing for the sport if done correctly here. But these games were just not interesting. The best game of the New Year Six this year was Texas and Georgia. And the best thing to happen in that game happened before the game started when Bevo tried to make a meal out of Ugga. Well, I got, you do give some credit to UCF and LSU, though. I still think Texas and, Ugga and UGA was a better game. And it does establish Texas as a definite threat for next season if they can get past Maryland. Hopefully they don't play Maryland. It would help oh, them to not God, play Maryland. Not. <laughs> it would help them to not play Maryland. <laughs> <laughs> That's going to finish us up for studs and duds. It's now time for so. That happened. Eric? Well, since we're talking about national championships and dynasties and uh, people winning on a regular basis, I'm going to give a shout out to the true college football national champion. You see, the North Dakota State University Bison, their fans said originally when they made the move up from Division II to the FCS, they wouldn't see a playoff of any kind for a good 30 years. I mean, you think about it, you're going up against better competition, the likes of Georgia State, Furman, Eastern Washington, what have you. But what have they done? They have created a dynasty not seen in any level of college football outside of, say, Mount Union or Wisconsin Whitewater. They beat the Eastern Washington Eagles in Frisco, Texas, to win their seventh national championship in eight years. 38-24 for those wondering along at home. And with a special shout out, to previous stud winner Chris Kleeman, the coach of North Dakota State, now going to be the at Kansas State, which should strike fear into hearts of Big 12 schools, such as the West Virginia Mountaineers. As well as Easton Stick, quarterback, who led that senior class to, oh, God, I can't even remember their exact record. It was so ungodly. <laughs> they, Let me they... ask you a question. Oh, sorry, Brandon, I'm going to cut you off here real quick. Let me ask you a question, Jason. Does it worry you that a mind such as Clemens is coming to the Big 12, going to a school such as K-State, which has a history of providing good players, if not necessarily always good teams? No, I'm not worried. I, in Neil Brown, I trust now. 
Okay, what were you about to say, Brandon? I was just going to say that they are the real national champions. I mean, 15-0 and for Clemson is kind of hard to argue with the schedule that they played as well. I got to give Clemson credit. Yeah, and you it, know who else went 15-0? The 1897 University of Pennsylvania Quakers. How often have we talked um, about that in the last few decades? I want to fact check. I want to fact check you right there. Marshall University did it back in the 90s. But they were considered top flight. <laughs> Well, I guess technically they would have been uh, at uh, Division One Double A at the time, as it was known. Correct. Yeah. I believe that the year they went fifteen and zero, they beat Youngstown State in the final, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, because they played Youngstown State and for the championship like four years in a row. I felt like yeah. the Buffalo, like the Buffalo Bills in the championship, because you always <laughs> see Youngstown State and Marshall playing. Yeah, but the difference is, is Youngstown State actually won a couple of those, whereas, well, we all know the story in Buffalo. Let's not drag up history. The right, Four back, Falls. Which is still a damn good documentary, and I forgive you, Scott Norton. Jason, so that happened. So that happened. The one, um, do y'all know anything about anatomy? Do y'all know that your ankle is supposed to be pointing the oh, same way as your God. Oh, God. Oh, yeah, that Alan's, was painful. Alan Hearns learned that his ankle can also point the opposite direction when he suffered one of the most horrific ankle injuries I've ever seen at any sporting event. When his leg snapped on a close-up while I'm eating dinner at a local restaurant, and me and a few of my friends witnessed this. I look up. We're watching the game. I look up, and I just casually say, huh, his foot ain't supposed to be that way, which draw, uh, drew everybody's attention around us to the screen, and you heard the audible gasp and, oh, my gods, and a few ex colorful language. And then they showed the replay, and you've seen the snap. I suggest if you're listening to this and you have not seen the injury, do not search it. It is, it is bad. Um, you know, with my medical background, they actually set the foot on the field. Mm -hmm. And he was very, very, very medicated why he was having this done. Uh I, I think Alan Hearns is a great guy. He does a lot of charities, a lot of stuff for the community that he's been a part of. Uh, when he was in Jacksonville, he was a big part of the community there. When mm -hmm. he went to Dallas, when he went to Dallas, he established himself as a part of the community. He did a lot of char uh, charitable work. All around great guy. And, I, and that's coming from a Giants fan who absolutely hates anybody in the division. But Alan Hearns is one of the few few guys that I could get behind that I liked. Uh, it was, as long as he wasn't in a Cowboys jersey, I was all for him. Um, and with that being said, I really hope this injury is able to for him to bounce back from. Uh, he's a good – he's a great receiver. He's not a great receiver. He's a good possession receiver. He has speed. But, honestly, I think this injury might have cut his career short. Yeah, yeah, that uh, real quick, it, real, real quick. I just I, I want to point out the sadness of us having to do this on this show every week, because if you guys think about this now, this is four episodes of the kickoff, and in those four episodes of the kickoff, with one week exception, it has been Alex Smith, the quarterback for Mackenzie Milton for UCF, and now Alan Hearns, all suffering major leg injuries in games. We have got to do more to protect these players. Eric, I, go ahead. I, I completely agree. And I mean, having him here in Jacksonville, he was really one of the guys, Jason pointed out, a key man of the community, valuable charity work. And when I initially heard the news leading up to the season that he would be one of the guys let go for completely stupid reasons, I thought, Real, what the hell is going on? And seeing him in Dallas and flourishing, hoping that he would be one of the former Jaguars in the playoffs in contention to get a ring and see that happen, it 
tragic. I mean, I even had a chiseled John Adonis joke ready for this, but I'm just nah. No. Well, it, it was it was pretty crazy for me because um, I was watching the game uh, with Tori's sister's uh, husband, and I was kind of just looking at some other things on the computer as that play was going on. And he saw it, he was like, oh, damn. And I didn't fully see the replay. And then they didn't show any more of the replays, which was shocking. Although I understand why Fox didn't do that. Um, but it w- But then, like, I pulled it up online and I saw it. I was like, ooh, that looked bad. Having I didn't I didn't get a chance to see the game live. I was spending time with Christine. I was unable to watch the game live. I did like Brandon see the replay online. I am not somebody who upsets easily. I'm not somebody who gets offended by clips like that. Mm-hmm. As a wrestling fan, I've seen stuff similar. <laughs> We've to that seen game. plenty bad. Uh, Psycho Sid at WCW Sin 2001 comes to mind immediately. I remember seeing that the very first time, and even I gagged a little bit. Mm-hmm. Just to, uh, as as you could see the replay, you could actually see like part of his bone sticking out of his skin. Yeah, mm-hmm. I, I, I looked at that, and all I could just say was "ow," very loud at my phone. On a bright, uh, on a bright side, from everything that I've seen, it was a, I mean, I guess what people call a clean break. Okay. And it was easily repaired. Mm. Well, that's on good behalf, for him. On behalf of everybody here at the kickoff, not that he'll ever hear this, we'd like to send our well wishes for a speedy recovery to Alan Hearns. Mm-hmm. And if Alan Hearns wants and does listen to this, you can tweet us. We'll be happy to oblige. We'll say hi to you. <laughs> All right, Brady, we'll you're up. Since get well court. <laughs> so my uh so that happened this week is away from the NFL field and into a uh a compet well, I guess you could call them a pe- competitor to an extent, even though it's different season. Brad Childress, who was supposed to be the head coach for the Atlanta Legends this season, going uh, of the AAF, uh, going into this upcoming inaugural season for them, decides to leave a little over a month, or a little under a month, the season is supposed to start. Um... This is very interesting because, as Harry is going to talk about shortly, um, the coaching carousel is in full swing now in the NFL. Does this necessarily does this potentially mean that Brad Childress is getting offers from NFL teams? And if so, and even if not so, it is a it is definitely not a good sign for the AAF going into their inaugural season, if they're losing one of their, I dare say, one of their top coaches going into the season before the season even starts. Eric? Ah, for that one, I think it is a bit of a bad look. And I hope it's because that Childress is getting legitimate offers. But I would spin that into a positive if I'm the AAF, especially the Atlanta Legends. Because, number one, that shows the more legitimacy and the power of their head coaches. The fact that some of them are still getting these NFL offers. And, number two, let Michael Vick take over more of the offense from a coaching standpoint. That you get a little extra built-in PR right there in your favor heading towards the beginning of the season. So there's good that can come out of this if they do it right. I, See, I, I worry I worry about the flip side of this, though, that it might not necessarily be because of anything related to the NFL, but it might be more of a personal situation for Tildrick here. And what kind of stress that this new league launching, this new scheduling and everything about having to basically start team from scratch is going to do for these coaching staff. Uh, I mean, I can understand that to an extent, but 
you know, I don't know if that's really the... I, I don't know if that would be the reason because you would think, you know, yes, you have to build a brand new team and all of that. But you would think that there's just as much pressure in the NFL. Not not to mention the fact that you were doing this because they've only been making these coaching announcements over the past few months anyways. And it's actually easier to build an AAF staff because of the rules and gameplay of how it's going to be. There's less concentration on certain aspects of the game. I mean, you don't even have kickoffs, period, so you don't have to worry about a, you know, kicker other than for field goals. Exactly. Issues but, with the play clock, things like that. Yeah. So you're building in a different style anyways. And and gonna... Go ahead. Go ahead, Brian. Um, I was just gonna say the one thing um I'll say about what Eric said is I kind of disagree with you on the level if he is getting offers from the NFL, I think of it very much in a wrestling uh mindset of, you know, the NFL, while they may not necessarily think, oh, they're a competition or anything like that, some of the NFL teams may be thinking, not only can we get a good coach, but we can also hurt the AAF in the process. Jason, you haven't had a chance to say anything here. You got any thoughts on this? No, I mean, I'm not learned anything about it because my shift at Buffalo Wild Wings has not permitted me to follow the story as closely as I'd like. <laughs> this besides that, that there's too much focus on Atlantic City in that part of the world. So, yeah. <sighs> the views and opinions of Jason T. <laughs> okay, so let's talk coaching carousel, shall we? Let's do it. My so that happened is the fact that we have now filled four of the head coaching vacancies in the NFL and are in potential talks to fill a fifth as well. Let's break them down. The Cleveland Browns are going to be hiring Brad Kitchens to replace Greg Williams. I thought, isn't his name Freddie Kitchens? Oh, Freddie Kitchens. Yeah, I pulled a Brandon. Sorry, my bad. <laughs> Uh, my my ESPN article closed on me, and I don't know why, so now I have to find it again. So, darling, for anyway, let's talk about some of the other ones, too. We'll get back to the uh, Cleveland situation here. Um, Vic Fangio getting a head coaching job in the NFL. I want to get your guys' thoughts on that there. I believe Fangio's going to Arizona. Nope, he is going to Denver. Denver. Kingsbury Den- yeah, is Denver. going to Arizona. I, I knew it was one of those West Coast teams there. Uh, your guys' thoughts on the, the best defensive co- coordinator – from this season here from a Bears team that had arguably one of the best defensive seasons in recent memory going over to uh going over to become a head coach here. If I'm not mistaken, won't this be Fangio's first head coaching job as well? Mm-hmm. Which and is a little bit of a which is a little bit of a surprise as well, because usually you don't see first time coaches hired and we'll talk about that in just a few seconds. Go ahead, Brandon. Well, not only that, I mean, the the first-time coaches thing is one thing. We've been seeing it over the last couple of years. It seems like it's the new trend where teams are trying to get younger coaches and getting, you know, different styles coming into their uh, systems and, and bringing in new systems into their teams. But the the bigger thing for me is that the trend, at least over the last couple of years, has been, oh, we've been uh, trying to hire uh, offensive coordinators and focusing more on offensive uh, experimentation, whereas he is a defense and very, you know, I would say traditional defensive coordinator as well. So this is definitely a different spin. Yes, it's Denver, and you've got Elway focusing on the offensive side of things, but it's going to be very interesting to see how this impacts the league overall. Well, the right. one smart thing that uh, Fangio did is he's keeping Kubiak, so all that with offense is really going to stay pretty much the same. Now, I will bring this to your point. And they're going ahead and they're focusing on strengthening this defense and keeping the offense the same. 
what is Elway going to do with Case Keenum? How many more years is he going to keep him around? How quick is he going to potentially try and draft another quarterback? See, that was kind of going to be my thought on this year is if Fangio is taking over there, how long does Case Keenum still have a job in Denver? Because I'm willing to bet, based on the disappointing performance that Keenum had this year coming off of the big money contract that he got coming from Minnesota last year, I don't think it's going to be very long at all. Uh, March 1st. What's their draft pick? Um, like, eight, set, like, uh... I know they're ahead of Buffalo because Buffalo beat them straight up, and Buffalo picks like ninth. So I'm guessing probably like sixth or seventh. Giants are six, so they're they're probably seventh or eighth. I just don't know how many uh, quarterbacks are going to be available. Well, I mean, if you look at it, there's not very many quarterback needy teams. No, in the top five. Who are who are in the top five? Arizona, uh, who has Josh Rosen. Arizona. True. The Jets, who have Sam Darnell. True. Oakland, who might look for a quarterback yeah. if they're planning on shipping off Derek Carr. But they're not going to take him. They're not going to take a quarterback that high, that high. San Francisco, who has Jimmy Garoppolo yeah. and Nick Mullins. So I don't think they're in the market for a quarterback. And I could not tell you who picks fifth because I do not know. I think Tampa Bay, though. And they have Winston. Uh, so actually, yeah. So that could that you could potentially see them going after a quarterback. All right, a couple other ones here. Let's talk about Freddie Freddie Kitchens here. Thank you for the correction, Eric. I appreciate it. Are no you guys sweat. surprised? Are you guys surprised that Greg Williams does not get the opportunity to get a full season in Cleveland? Because I am one hundred percent astounded by this decision here. I figured for sure that when Williams turned that team around and took a team that. Um, Hugh Jackson had started one, four and one with before he was fired, one, five and one with or something like that before he fired and led them to seven wins, a seven win season overall coming up just a couple of yards short against Baltimore of finishing above 500 this year. I thought for sure that Greg Williams was a lock to get another season as the head coach in Cleveland. Eric, your thoughts here. I mean, granted while with Freddie Kitchens, the offense was tremendously better and they did go five and three with that I I have to agree Greg Williams as much as Kitchens developed that rapport with Baker Mayfield and everything improved offensively there were a lot of major improvements and continuations defensively that Cleveland really focused on and for Greg Williams that would have been a huge opportunity for him to take over at least get that one full season, but not even getting the interview and going with the trend of offensive, offensive coaches. How are you going to fare post Thanksgiving? I don't like how Cleveland handled this. Here, here's the, here are two questions I have. First off, what was Williams's position prior to when he became the head coach? Okay. I think that's one big factor. Like Eric said it and, and, the Bron- the Broncos are the uh, are, are the exception to the rule. It seems, but like Eric said, it seems like everyone's going after offensive coordinators and offensive minded coaches now for their head coaching jobs. Um, I think that plays an impact. Also, you never know. Maybe Williams felt there was too much pressure being the full head coach and said, "Let me take you know, let me go either." Maybe he becomes the defensive coordinator again, or he goes somewhere else to be a coordinator. I can tell you for sure that he definitely wanted the full-time head coaching position because as soon as the decision was announced that Kitchens was going to be the head coach, Williams resigned. Okay. Uh, Let's move to... Just a quick, Go ahead, just a quick touch. Uh, Denver drafts 10. 10. Okay. I would think yes, it, how- it goes. It goes Cardinals, Niners, Jets, Raiders, Bucks, Giants, Jags, Lions, Bills, Broncos is your top ten. So yeah, I could I could have sworn that we were seventh. So I could I see three, maybe four teams drafting quarterback. 
I could have sworn that I could have sworn that the Broncos drafted ahead of the Bills because Buffalo beat Denver this year. Well, they may have what a the... better, or they may have a worse record, though. No, we have a better overall record than they do. Oh. Um, actually, I think we both finished six and ten, if I'm not mm. mistaken. Anyway, back to the coaching thing, real quick. One last one that I want to touch on here is. Uh, the whole Matt LaFleur thing kind of throws me for a surprise with him landing in Green Bay, but the rumors are that he was speaking to Aaron Rodgers before he accepted the job, and this hire is Aaron Rodgers approved, which we kind of figured it would be. The question that I have for you guys about this one is going to be, will it actually be LaFleur running the team, or will it be Aaron Rodgers? Look, who's got the State Farm commercials? (laughs) Who's been California cool? Who's been discount double check for God knows how long? Aaron Rodgers wanted this to be his team. He wanted to be the big cheese in Green Bay. Now he is. Yeah, this is definitely Aaron Rodgers' team. I mean, this is Matt LaFleur's first head coaching job. Um, This is definitely one of those hires where this was Aaron Rodgers pulling the strings and making sure that he got a, a head coach that would bend to his whim. Yeah, because honestly, they better be real sharp in handling this because uh, there's quite a lot of holes to fill. All right, one other one that I do want to touch on here is the hire of Cliff Kingsbury in Arizona. Jason, I want to get your thoughts on this because we've had kind of this long simmering rivalry with Robert Taylor all year due to uh, the performance of a certain guy whose time it may or may not be. His former coach now gets an opportunity in the NFL – uh, buy or sell, this is going to fail tremendously and he'll be fired after two seasons at the most. I, I don't even think he makes it two seasons. I think I think he makes it a season and three games into the 2020 season and will be his seat will be uh, vacant. Uh, I think he has potential, but I think if you're going to establish him you need to establish him with a in a more predominant team setting with uh more pieces in place than arizona um yeah they have they have a franchise quarterback they have a solid running back but they're losing their the face of the franchise receiver after this year either retirement or free or he just leaves Phoenix. Um, so you're going to be in a lot of rebuilding. And as we all know, when you're rebuilding, fans don't like that. General managers don't like that. Front offices don't like that. So I think he's going to be on a very short lease. And I think he is set up for failure. All right, real quick, I'll get Eric and Brandon's answer to this as well, and then we'll move on. Eric, buy or sell? Two seasons tops for Cliff Kingsbury in Arizona. I'm going to buy, and I'm not even going to give him three games under 2020. I'm going to give him this one season. With that certain quarterback, the, whose name you did not mention, whose time might be coming on Saturday again, Cliff Kingsbury went a whopping 16-21. and 21. In his overall career at Texas Tech, 35 and 40. Now, granted, he was a quarterback for Texas Tech when I really started getting into college football in the early 2000s. So, naturally, going to alma mater, it should be a great story. I get you want to go to the big boy job and go to greener pastures, but if he really wanted to establish himself and set himself up as a head coach, He should have stayed being the offensive coordinator at USC. His time would have come. He's still a young guy, would have had a gradual path because getting fired from your alma mater, then getting only a year where you're going to be miserable without a doubt in Arizona, that does not look good on your resume. I think the big issue was for for him when it came to USC was the fact that they blocked him from talking to these teams about moving to the NFL, and I think that's what caused him to leave. 
and, and I understand that, but at the same time, it's like, have you ever thought that maybe they're doing you a bit of a favor? Because for all we know, they blocked him from talking to the NFL, which, yeah, that gets in your craw. But at the same time, who's to say they didn't offer him, from what I've heard, this potential, hey, you stick around a year or two, though the words coach and waiting mean anything to you? Come on now. Certain it, things, I get why you shouldn't do it, and I get that's what would motivate you, but if you take a step back and look at the big picture, it might help you in the long run. If that was the deal that they made or the you know the implication that they made of saying, hey, stick around for another couple of years as the offensive coordinator and we'll give you the head coaching job, then I agree with you. But if that's not the case, then it's kind of a dick move and you mm-hmm. see where it got them because if he hadn't left USC because of this and he still talked to these teams, he might have gotten some offers, yes, but he may have said, eh, it's not good enough, it's not looking good enough, I'll stick where I am at the time for the time being. But Mm -hmm. them trying to throw their muscle around and saying, no, we're not going to allow you to do this is what caused this. And that I do agree with. All right, let's move on here because we still have a lot of stuff to get to. And we're already pushing uh, 40 minutes into tonight's episode. So let's go ahead and move on to Eric. I think you're going to enjoy the name of what I'm going to call this segment for the rest of the season that we do it. I'm listening. So you know how we each predicted our impact players for the wild card divisional or for the wild card round games? Mm-hmm. Well, we're each going to p- predict impact players for the divisional games this week. In this segment, I am officially calling Point of Impact. Ha <laughs> I like it. That. I thought that you might. We open with Indianapolis at Kansas City, the four thirty game on Saturday. Eric, we start with the Colts coming off of their victory over the Houston Texans, 21-7. to Who do you have for the Colts as the standout? Personally, Captain Andrew Luck himself. He's gotten the care package. He has fresh squirrel oil. He's going to manage the chief trickery of losing a day's travel by arriving in Lawrence. We have talked so much about this Chiefs defense especially this chief secondary. If he could have anything like a repeat performance, what he's done to close the regular season, what he did against Houston, and anything similar to what he did when these two teams last met in the playoffs, the Colts run could potentially continue. Now I'm going to talk a a little bit about bets later on in the show, but... If they do the right film, uh, you're going to want to place certain wagers that may counter my advice. Brandon. Um, my impact player, well, players for um, the Colts this week, one in particular, but overall I'm going to say the front seven for uh, the Colts' defense, and one in particular, Darius Leonard, uh, him coming into this game. um, You know, we've talked about it a lot this season, mostly because of Robert Taylor, but, you know, this is going to be Mahomes' first playoff foray. So there's going to be that pressure, and we saw what happened to quarterbacks who are in their first playoff games Last week with Lamar Jackson. So if Darius Leonard and the rest of that front seven can get some pressure on Mahomes, yes, we know he's very mobile and he's very sneaky, but if they can keep him on edge, that could be a big impact. What's the old line, Eric? Pressure burst pipes? Yep. Mm Mm-hmm. Jason, who's your impact, Colt? Adrian James. First of all, Adrian. I just figure out. I Second figure of all, I get, you're about a decade. No, ago. no, it's it's his cousin. 
He's the water boy. He's a special teams water boy. And he's going to keep everybody hydrated so they don't cramp up. Okay? Well, you need... What you his can cousin got him the job when he was in Indianapolis. <laughs> All right, give me a real answer. Uh, I'm going to say T.Y. Hill, and I think T.Y. is going to build upon what he done in Houston. Um Plus, uh, Eric already took luck, and I couldn't take him. So I'm going to go with T.Y. I think T.Y. is going to want to perform on that elite level of receiver that he's capable of. And I say that T.Y. is going to be the definite X factor in this game for Indianapolis. But technically speaking, even though Eric took luck, you could take luck as well. I don't want to. I, I, we got to. I like being different. <laughs> All right, well, I don't. I'm taking T.Y. Hilton, and I had that planned before you said him. Whatever. Lies. It's okay. You want to be like me. I understand <laughs> that you that – Hilton I understand had... the second place. I understand being second place to fantasy football. You want to follow in my footsteps. You knew anyway. I was going to get it in at some point this week. Yeah, I was waiting. All right, anyway. What, you Hilton mean like had... me? <laughs> Hilton actually did have a strong game against the uh, Houston Texans. However, there's one thing that Hilton did not do in that game against the Houston Texans, and that was put a ball in the end zone. If the Indianapolis Colts are going to beat the Kansas City Chiefs, T.Y. Hilton has, has, has to get into the end zone, and probably multiple times. Let's flip it around here, Eric. Let's talk about the Kansas City Chiefs side of the ball. There was about five jokes I had brewing in my head. Anyways, to me with the Chiefs, I'm taking the running back core. We know what Mahomes can do on offense. 5,000 yards, 50 touchdowns, no-look passes, deep balls to the cheetah, everything. But like going up against Darius Leonard in this front seven, you have to back them off and really keep them honest. So it is up to that crew Slow the tempo down just a little bit. Account for the weather, make things easier on Mahomes, especially early. Get him into the flow of the game. So that way, even come the second quarter, he can go ahead and start balling out. But they have to establish that ground game first and foremost right now. I trust Andy Reid to do that, but it's up to those running backs to execute. Uh, normally Brandon would go next here. However, I just want to say for the record that before Eric even went there, I had already written down on my whiteboard, D. Dot Williams, Damian Williams, running back Kansas City is my impact player. <laughs> See, as the host, Eric, you do need to make some executive decisions and go first every once in a while. <laughs> I'll, 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 I'm going to say, hey, Eric, mm-hmm. Harry's going to Bisco. Yeah. I knew was coming. <laughs> I knew that was coming as soon as he opened his mouth. <laughs> Brandon, who, who's your impact player for the Chiefs? Hey, uh, hey, uh, hey, Harry, guess what time it is? <laughs> At least he didn't pick a quarterback for Indianapolis. Do, do, do you know what time it is, Harry? I don't know what time it is. My watch is broken. Er, Eric, shall we? I'm, I'm pretty sure it's Mahomes' time. That is correct. Well, one would hope. Um, but yeah, Patrick Mahomes, like I mentioned when I was talking about the front seven for uh, Indianapolis, this is his first playoff game. And like we talked about before, a little honorable mention. I know it's not a player, but, you know, honorable mention to Andy Reid as well because, you know, we all know how Andy Reid does in playoff situations. So if Mahomes can get past the 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 despicable nature of Andy Reid in playoff situations and can avoid what happened to Lamar Jackson last week, yeah, I think the Chiefs could be okay. I do definitely agree with Eric, though, that the running game is going to be a big impact because if they can't get a running game going, then they're going to be focused completely on Mahomes, and that just spells doom. Now, I got to do one quick stat to kind of come to Andy Reid's defense. In his career, coming off of a bye, 
He is 20 and four, three and one in the playoffs. Okay. Yeah, but I'll point out that it was an AFC South team that knocked him out last year. <laughs> Fair. <laughs> Jason, who's your standout player for the Chiefs? Um, well, to uh, build upon what Brandon said, I was actually not going to go with a player originally. Uh, I was going to go with Andy Reid because the wal- Walrus is known to choke during the playoffs. But since Brandon and I already touched on that, I'm going to go with Travis Kelsey is going to be the X factor for the Chiefs. He's going to have to have a huge game and show his athleticism against linebackers and mismatched DBs. Uh, you might not get the big play down build from him, but you will get the yak, yards after catch. And that's going to be what is going to be key for Mahomes' success, but more importantly, Kelsey's success. All right, to mix it up a little bit from last week, we're going to have each of us start a different game here. So the night game on Sunday is Dallas at Los Angeles as the Cowboys go to the Rams, the Los Angeles NFC. Brandon, you start us off with Dallas. Who's your impact player? Hmm. My my impact player for this week is going to be Amari Cooper. Amari Cooper, excuse me. Um, especially with um, wow, I'm drawing a blank on his name. Alan Hearns. Yeah, Hearns. Yeah, Hearns. Especially with Hearns out, and also uh, their other receiver was also um, banged up a little bit in the game last week while he played for the rest of the game, he was banged up. Cooper's going to have to take a lot of that. He's going to be taking a lot of the offense in the passing game for the Cowboys. And he's going to get double teamed a lot. So he's going to have to really make a big effort and a big impact in this game. If the Cowboys want to win. Jason. I'm actually going to say Zeke has to have be a big player, and because Dallas is going to have to control the clock and establish her own game, because like I pointed out to somebody in a recent sports chat room, Dak Prescott is not an elite quarterback. He will not beat you with his arm. He's not going, especially against a solid defense like the Rams. It's going to be more about clock management more than anything. So you're going to have to feed Zeke and feed him often. See, I'm actually going to disagree with you here. I think if the Dallas Cowboys are going to win this game, then it has to be on the shoulders of Dak Prescott. I think that the Rams are going to stack the line, the front seven against Zeke Elliott, knowing that Prescott's not the kind of guy that can beat you. And Prescott is going to have to prove that he is the kind of guy that can single-handedly beat you by getting the ball to his receivers, to Amari Cooper, to Ezekiel Elliott coming out of the backfield, to uh, Blake Jarwin, who had a very disappointing performance against Seattle, even though the Cowboys won. To me, this is the game where Dak Prescott has to prove that he's worth the money that Dallas is paying him if he wants Dallas to continue paying him going forward. Eric? I'm actually going to go on the other side of the ball. In order for Dak to have a chance to even make those plays with his arm. I'm thinking that the Dallas defense is a step up, specifically Leighton Vander Esch. Todd Gurley for the Shut Rams. Up. Todd Gurley for the Rams hasn't had more than 16 touches in a game. I think maybe right at since right around Thanksgiving. This is the time that the Rams are really going to like the Cowboys want to grind down the Tampa a little bit to help golf out and avoid a repeat of what happened last year. Is it up to Van Der Esch and the rest of that linebacking core stop Gurley and force golf and the Rams to be a bit more one-dimensional? Yes, they do have some weapons out wide, but if you take out one of their main factors, it's a lot easier to game plan. 
Interesting question to bring up here. Do you think last year's loss to Atlanta at home sits poorly with the Rams here? Do you think that affects their performance? This is just a general question. Mm, no, I don't think. Go ahead. Um, I was just going to say, I don't think so. I think if anything, it'll light a fire underneath them and make them want to basically redeem themselves for what happened last year. I, I think it will creep in a teeny bit bit but it would also really depend on the crowd you lose like that in front of a pretty much pro rams crowd now you're going back to the playoffs again after that loss to where this could be 50 50 this could be 55 45 cowboys fans it could be 60 40 cowboys Mm -hmm. fans especially considering it's a cowboys The Cowboys are a team that traditionally travel well, so I and think that I think that if this game gets away from Los Angeles early, it could be a very long day for the Rams. Not and to mention, those... go ahead, Eric. Go ahead. Oh, I was just gonna say, combine that with the fact they spend their trying time in training camp in Oxnard. Well, I, what I was also gonna say was. Los Angeles, prior to just a couple of years ago, didn't have a football team. And Los Angeles is a very trendy city. So, America's team being, you know, the bandwagoners team, I'm sure there are a lot of bandwagon Cowboys fans still in the area. So Mm -hmm. that will also play an impact. Plus, even without the football team, Los Angeles was a Rams town, and the Rams hated back in the 50s and 60s. Ever since the 80s, even after they left, you could argue that L.A. is more of a Raiders town, especially when the Rams moved south to play in Anaheim in the early 90s. All right, let's move over to the other side of the football here, Brandon. Who has to stand out for the Rams in order to prevent what happened to Atlanta last year happening again? I, I, I have to go with Todd Gurley. You know, the um, the wide receiver core isn't 100% for the, uh, for the Rams. Uh, Goff is going to be under a lot of pressure. Gurley's going to have to take that pressure off of him. Jason? I'm actually going to say Jared Goff. Uh, they're going to try to stop Gurley, and Goff's going to have to beat people with his arm. I'm going to go with Sean McVay. I think that Sean McVay's play calling has to be to the point that they don't allow themselves to get put into a position like they did against Atlanta last year, where the Falcons were able to take that home field advantage away from the Rams. I think that McVay has to have his offense strike early and strike often and get these pro Cowboys fans out of this game in order to keep his Rams team concentrated and motivated to move forward towards being potentially at home, depending on what happens in the Philadelphia-New Orleans game, or possibly going to the Superdome for the NFC Championship game the following Sunday. Eric? I'm going to go with one of those Rams wide receivers, Robert Woods. Lately, especially the second half of the season post-Cooper Cup injury, he's been slowly having those more sneaky good performances. Now it's time for him above anybody because he lines up all over across the line of scrimmage. He needs to be the guy to help get golf very comfortable in that offense. He's got the talent and he's shown that he can do it. He has to do it early, especially if Todd Gurley finds himself on a slow start. We move over to the one o'clock game on Sunday as the Los Angeles Chargers interesting that they're playing in back-to-back games, travel to New England to take on the Patriots. Jason, you start us off with the Chargers. Um, Honestly, I think the key to the Chargers is going to be Phillip Rivers. Uh, He's sneaky good. I mean, he doesn't put up gaudy numbers like you would expect a quarterback to do, but He's also a leader, and I think his leadership skills is going to have to shine through, and he's going to have to keep the team focused and 
actually be the on on the field general that he's capable of being that he has been through the regular season. I'm going to go with the same guy I picked last week, even though he had a kind of a disappointing performance other than the fact that he did get into the end zone at the start of the fourth quarter. I'm going to go with Melvin Gordon the third. I think that the Chargers are going to have to control the ball against New England and keep Tom Brady and his arsenal weapons off of the field. I know Brady and the, and the Patriots are down a weapon with the whole Josh Gordon situation, but given the fact that Bill Belichick had the extra week in order to game plan for this game here, I wouldn't put it past them that they have a way to solve the lack of Josh Gordon problem here by working other people into their offense on a much more consistent basis, basis excuse me, such as the wide receiver that's playing running back for them that came over from Minnesota, Cordero Patterson. So for me, I think that Melvin Gordon's going to have to control this game by keeping it ground heavy and keeping the time of possession in strictly in the Chargers' favor in order to be able to keep Brady and the Patriots off of the field. Eric, who you got? Antonio Gates. The Patriots have shown a lot of what they can do with their tight ends. Going back to Aaron Hernandez and especially Rob Gronkowski. You know Antonio Gates isn't Rob Gronkowski, but him coming back for this one run, can he channel a little bit more of that old magic to be that number one guy or even a number two and continue that relationship that he has had just about his entire career with Philip Rivers. Because if you give the Patriots one more choice of what they have to take away and change their scheme a little bit, that can make them vulnerable. You'll want the Patriots to be as vulnerable as possible. Brandon, you wrap us up for this game, or for this side of the game with the Chargers. Um, I have to go with Philip Rivers here. Um, you know, he's been very, like I mentioned last week, he's been very good in the regular season, but when it's come down to the playoffs, he's had some issues. And this is against the Patriots, so this is, you know, the big one, even though, you know, obviously the Super Bowl would be the big one, you know, on that level. The Patriots still are the team to beat and are the big, uh, are that big stepping stone for the AFC when it comes to any team that's looking to be a true contender for the Super Bowl. Um, And like I mentioned last week, this is one of the, if not the last hurrah and last real opportunity that Rivers has to potentially win a Super Bowl and to cement his legacy. So this is going to be a big one for him. Let's flip to the other side of the football here with the New England Patriots, Jason. Um, actually, huh. I'm gonna actually have to say Gronk's gonna have to step up. Uh, he's been kind of invisible all season, and his toughness has come into question. So, if the Patriots to move forward, he's gonna have to actually lead the team in receiving. See, I actually think it's their other wide receiver that has to do that. The man who has really not shown up much this year, that being Julian Edelman, who was suspended for the first four games of the season. I think that Edelman has the opportunity to redeem himself. And I think that losing Josh Gordon, losing that weapon that they did with Gordon, Edelman has to step up and be the number one receiver that he's been in New England before, even more so to the point of above the level that he was at when he still had Danny Amendola by his side. Eric? James White, if you don't want guys like Joey Bolsa being able to just sit back and try to tee off, knowing the weaknesses that they have at wide receiver, White's got to have a good game on the ground. And as I believe it was Jason who said, time of possession, run game, grind the game down to a halt. How do you do that? Yards on the ground. If White can get those yards, it makes it an easier day for Brady. I'm going to... Real quick, that was me that mentioned the controlling the ground, but your point is validated. My bad. (laughs) Brandon, go ahead. I'm going to basically combine all three of yours into one and add a person as well. It's got to be the entire receiving core and the... The one guy, if I had to choose one guy that, you know, while he may not have the greatest game in the world, 
He may not get a ton of targets, but if he can be a threat in the passing game and thus take some pressure away from other guys and take away the pressure from Brady as a whole, it would help the Patriots' offense a lot, and that's Chris Hogan. Interesting fact here. Four of us went. None of us took Brady. I had a chance to look back on ESPN.com over the course of the last couple of days. Did you know that this is Tom Brady's worst statistical season of his career? That he did not finish. He did not finish in the top five in any category. Wow, that's shocking. I remember hearing about that because uh, that was part of his incentive laden contract for this year. He missed out on the bank. You, you want to know why we didn't really hear much about it this year? Is because they never really had any... While they didn't have the greatest season in the world, they still won... <laughs> they, they still won, you know, a lot of games. And they never really had that loss like they did last year against the Chiefs where it made people think, oh, is this maybe the beginning of the end for Brady? Eh, you could say... Possibly the game against the Jaguars. Eh, but a lot of people chalk that up to the Jaguars' defense being really good more than Brady starting to slip. True. Yeah, but I mean, you said yourself, 10 consecutive division titles hasn't been done in the major four mm-hmm. pro sports since the Braves. 16 consecutive 10 win seasons. That hasn't been done since the Niners in the 80s and 90s. And, oh, by the way, the ninth straight year where he's earned a bye. Mm-hmm. If this is business as usual. Yep. 11-5, this is what we expect from them. Let's go to our final game. It is Sunday on Fox at 425. BDN and the Philadelphia Eagles travel to the Superdome to take on the New Orleans Saints. I go first here. I'm actually going to go with the guy that Brandon mistakenly named earlier in the show. I think this is going to be a really close game, much the same way the Chicago game was. To me, this game very realistically could come down to the foot of Jake Elliott. I'm picking Elliott as my potential impact player here. Eric? Wow, I was tempted to go Golden Tate again. He got you a point, half a point last week. Yeah, but honestly, with this one and the framework of this game, I'm going to have to go to someone like Darren Sproles. He showed off a bit of his talents in Chicago against a very tough defense and even on special teams. Can he do something like that where you have an easier time weather-wise, although strangely in Chicago, that's the one day in the past 30 years with no wind whatsoever. That was freakish. (laughs) But can he do something like this against New Orleans? Can he help out? Maybe even on catch a few more passes from the backfield himself, go and turn back the clock his own way? And he can do that and give Nick Foles another weapon? Hey, BDN could double doink and keep this thing going. (laughs) Brandon? Um... I, I have to go with who I picked last week again. The the storyline is going to be going on throughout this postseason for as long as the Eagles are in it. Can Big Dick Nick do it again? And he's got to show that last year wasn't just a fluke. Now, I'm going to say this one thing, and we were talking about all the different quarterbacks on the market and going around. They decide to get rid of him, and he finds his way to Jacksonville. The first thing I will do is get a custom number nine jersey that will say Big Dick Nick. I don't know <laughs> how I have to do to pull it off, and I'll even wear that to work too, just to show him. I'm in on this. <laughs> Jason? Hmm. Um. Philadelphia. I'm going to say Alshon Jeffrey. I think he's going to have to make some big plays and help stretch the ball downfield if they're to succeed. That's a, that's a pretty fair selection here. I think, honestly, 
realistically speaking, it could come down to the receiving core being able to break away from the New Orleans defenders much the same way that Stephon Diggs did in the, the miracle in Minnesota to send the Vikings to the NFC Championship game last year. Let's flip over to the other side of the ball here with the New Orleans Saints. And to me, this one isn't in question. Uh, you can say what you want. Uh, we've had some people on our network call him Captain Checkdown. But in my opinion, he is, at this point, the best quarterback in the NFL. This is Drew Brees' team to lead. And this is Drew Brees' team that I would trust more than anybody else running the ship if I had an NFL franchise. If you gave me one quarterback to start an NFL franchise with, I would want Drew Brees. I would trust Drew Brees to lead my team through any situation. I'm taking Brees as my impact player. Eric? Michael Thomas. NFL record, 320. Are you, hmm? are you sure you don't want Michael Williams? I'm positive this time. <laughs> you sure? I'm, I'm Michael, sure. Michael Williams is available to pick up. Take again. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. We've, we've all screwed up at least once tonight. I just thought it would be funny to throw something back. Go ahead and talk about Michael Thomas, Williams Thomas. Very true, and trust me, I actually made that mistake earlier today in a fantasy draft. Oh, God. Uh, NFL record, 321 catches in his first three seasons. He's shown he can be the man. You talk about Drew Brees being captain checkdown. He's got a big threat. Can Michael Thomas continue to be that guy? And uh, do a couple of things against this Eagles defense. Make this the shootout that a lot of us kind of want. <laughs> yeah, I, th I think if this is a high-scoring game, then it favors the Saints. If it's a low-scoring game, it probably favors the Eagles. Oh, it definitely favors the Eagles. Brandon? My, I, I definitely have to agree with you. Uh, Harry, it, th this is Breeze's team. This is uh, all about Drew. So, you know, yeah, th th it's Drew Breeze, hands down. Jason? I'm going to say Ingram. Ingram's going to have to be the X factor in this one because everybody else is going to be keyed out on and he's going to be able to run between the tackles like he needs to be, wear, help wear down the defense, and possibly get short yardage to keep drives rolling. Fair enough. Hey, Eric. Yeesh. Get it together. Uh, oh, okay. I, I mentioned this a little bit in the, uh, our chat, and I teased this earlier in the show. When it comes to playoff betting, and I admit I was guilty of this myself, be very, 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 very careful when you're betting the over. There was a lot of action, and there were some juicy totals out there. Don't do it. Yes, it would have come to your favor in a teeny bit with the Cowboys and Seahawks. Yes, it came to your favor when things where they got squeaky bum chargers and ravens. But um, especially when two division rivals are playing in the playoffs and you're out there like me being a rookie dumbass and taking the over, I got to join you and we all just need to get it together. God, that cost me money. <laughs> on the plus side, you were one of only two of us on this panel that did take the Colts to win that game then. That's why I got the Chargers and the Colts money line as a parlay that helped me break even on the weekend. I was very relieved. Jason, get it together. Get it together is the officiating crew from the Eagles and Bears game that, at hindsight, actually cost the Bear that, Bears that game on the Anthony Miller catch and fumbled that they blew dead when nobody went to recover the ball. That would have set up a easy score, or at least a chip shot for Chicago, that would have predominantly led to them winning the game. The uh, the other mentions for my bird box challenge joke. Oh, just 
I don't know what a bird box challenge is, and something tells me I don't want to know. <laughs> Google, Twitter, Netflix. This is one of that percentage of times where it is safe for work. Notice that he has to disclaimer that on the show. <laughs> yeah, that's really. all you need to know about Eric's life. <laughs> Look, how many? You know how many softballs you had for putting it in places and balls and stretching down the field. I was like. There were 45 seconds of solid gold in my head, especially with shenanigans that I have planned for this. Family show! <laughs> Apologies to those listening via headphones. Brandon, get it together. My get it together is college football just in general. Yes, I've talked about it a lot over the last couple of years, but, and this isn't even, yes, ideally you expand the playoffs, but Even if you're not going to do that simple thing, some of the top teams need to get better. This is getting ridiculous. This is getting to to NBA levels of boredom. Well, it's even worse than the NBA. But I hate... I don't even understand how anyone can watch the same thing every single year. It, it, it's, it, you know that whole saying, death, taxes, and whatever? It, there are three things that are guaranteed in life right now. Death, taxes, and Alabama Clemson in the, na- in the quote-unquote national championship. Well, technically they met in the semifinal last year, but I get your point. You know, I've heard some ideas being thrown around or at least discussed to where If you make the playoff, you get a reduction in scholarships for the next year. So I'm just counting down again. 2023 is only four years away. TV contract renewal. And if ESPN crunches the numbers and they find out they're losing money, you expect that time frame to close pretty damn quick. All right, let me ask you one quick question here, Brandon, because I know you're kind of the voice of the voiceless when it comes to the group of five on this show. Cult of personality. <laughs> uh, I, I sung Return of the Mac earlier, so I got no room to talk. Anyway, <laughs> uh, UCF has a chance to make a statement very early next season. Stanford comes to Orlando. What happens if Stanford comes to Orlando and beats the Golden Knights? Then, then they beat the Golden Knights. That, you know, but that's, that's my point that I've tried to make. While, yes, I would prefer it to be a situation where teams actually get opportunities to make the playoffs, if if they need to go through the BS channels and go through the pre go through the BS protocol that you know the college football playoff system has created, then so be it. But here's the thing. Especially, I don't know, I didn't see the way, way, way too early top 25 that they have out. But depending upon where Stanford is ranked at that time, what? They aren't. Okay. But let's say they are at that point when they play. And let's say they're ranked highly. I doubt it because Stanford hasn't been nearly as good over the last couple of years. They're not at the levels of when uh, when Christian McCaffrey was there or when Andrew Luck was there. But if they can beat Stanford and they proceed to go undefeated, then there can't be any BS excuse of, oh, they didn't play anyone or uh, strength of schedule or what have you. So I don't want it to be a situation where UCF or any other, you know, pow- uh, group of five school goes through this whole rigmarole of having to basically placate to the the powers that be in order to even supposedly give them a chance. But then if they do manage to beat said powerhouses, they still get snubbed because of their name. Another interesting fact for Central Florida next year will be a trip to Pittsburgh as well. Mm-hmm. See, so, so they're, starting, they're starting to get to bigger games. Mm-hmm. 
And that's the thing. Well, but that's the other issue, and I understand with, you know, well, uh, not really, because, you know, it it takes just as much time to plan it, and I would think it would actually be simpler to plan travel for a weekly basis rather than, you know, two maybe two or even three days in a week. But I want college football to implement the same sort of situation the same sort of scheduling as they have in college basketball where it's not that you have to make these games year a, a whole class in advance which basically makes the proposition of saying oh I'm going to schedule this team because they're good right now and they should help me completely moot because by the point that they actually play them five years after the fact, things could be completely changed on so many different levels. So it should be a year-by-year scheduling situation. So, I I kind of intrigued uh, Eric with mine, so I'm going to go ahead and get mine over with, and then we can get to our Are You Serious predictions for the divisional round. My get-it-together is Drake. Not the school out of Illinois or Missouri. Missouri, I think. I think Missouri, yeah. I think you're right. Is it Missouri or Nebraska? No, it's either Missouri or Illinois, I'm pretty sure. I don't think it's Nebraska. I think it's Missouri. Anyway, not the school, but the singer. Kentucky Wildcats. Uh, Struggling this season, bounced early from the NCAA tournament last year. Toronto Raptors lost game six to the Cleveland Cavaliers last year. Connor McGregor got knocked out by Khal- Khal- um, what's his name? Khabib Ne Nurmagomedov. Yeah. Khabib, but thank you. Yes. That's what I was thinking of. Get Zunite. Alabama <laughs> Crimson Tide got rolled by Clemson in the national championship game on Monday. Is there any chance we could find a way to get Drake photo- photographed wearing a Tom Brady jersey? <laughs> Please. Please. Yes. And by the way, we were all wrong. It's in uh, Des Moines, Iowa. Oh, okay. Iowa. Don't, don't they know nothing good comes from Iowa? <laughs> I'd apologize to our listeners in Iowa, but the only listeners we have in Iowa are the cornfields. <laughs> hey, no, I mean, wait, no. Different cornfield. She's in North Dakota. Never mind. There, there's only one good thing that ever came out of a cornfield in Iowa. Is that where Field of Dreams was filmed? Yes, it was. I kind of thought that's where you were going with that. And yes, I highly agree. That movie is mandatory. I, I've for. actually been there. Mandatory. Yeah, viewing I'm finally for glad you. that both farms are now or have been under one owner for some time. Because that was a point of contention for a while. Gentlemen, for the next to next to last time of the year, I have a question for you. Yes. Are you serious? All what? right, so we kind of delayed it last week. I should have done this last week. Your winner and regular season champion, Brandon Bitskabing. Huzzah! Brandon goes 13 and 21 straight up. I go 12 and 22. Son of a bitch. <laughs> Eric and Jason tie at five and twenty-nine. Oh man, man, silver must be your color, Harry. Granted, I can't call, but Brandon goes twenty and fourteen against the spread. I go seventeen, sixteen, and one. Thank you to the tie in the Georgia. What? Which one was it? Georgia? Oh no, Houston. It was a NFL game. Houston was a seven-point favorite. I had them as my lock, and they pushed. Jason goes 16 and 18. Eric goes 12 and 22. In an ironic twist, the current postseason Are You Serious leader is... Eric. Eric, at 3 and 1. <laughs> I show up when it counts. I'm like Nick <laughs> I was just about to say, he shows up when it really matters. <laughs> Eric went... Three and one straight up, two and two against the spread. Brandon went two and two straight up, three and one against the spread. Me wait, and Jason how does, went, wait, how does that work? That um, because um, Seattle lost, but they covered. 
Uh, oh, okay. Wait, yeah, wait, no, what? but how is he two and two, but three and one? Or how is he three and one straight up, but two and two against the spread? Because Seattle lost, but covered. Dallas won. He picked Dallas. And believe oh, okay. it or not, on my bookie, that one wound up as a push. That was so crazy. I have, I had Dallas minus two and a half from the ESPN chalk site that I saw. So that's what I went with. Oh, no, I know that's what you went with. But when I bet that line, it actually had it at Dallas minus two. So I was like, ah, oh, crap. <laughs> well, at least you got your money back. This is true. All right. Um, as I said, me and Jason are both one and three, two and two. Jason actually has the tiebreaker. Because he picked Indianapolis, I picked Houston. Houston fucked me royally. <laughs> I warned you, but no. Well, they screwed me too. So. Yeah, that was your only. That was your only uh, ATS loss, Brandon. Yeah, I know. Which you know, STBY, homie, <laughs> sucks to be you. Yep. All right, let me get back to the NFL predictions page. Stalling for time. Where's stalling for time? Uh, Eric, talk about Adam Gase and the Jets for a second, so that way I can have time to get this page pulled back Oh, up. yeah, I was going to ask if we were going to talk about that, if that was official yet or not. Uh, personally, uh, yes. I would have preferred had they gone with Mike McCarthy, oddly enough. I mean, Adam Gase, yeah, he was doing okay things with Ryan Tannehill, but at some point he hit really hit a wall in Miami. That's why he's gone. I have a feeling, especially now that Todd Bowles has gone south, he's really going to hit a wall with Sam Darnold and that Jets offense. I don't see this panning out too well in New York. I think this was a mistake. The the big question now, and, and Harry just brought it up, now with a lot of the doors closing, where does Mike McCarthy land? I think Mike McCarthy lands as a commentator next year. I could see that. He's setting, he's setting out this year to take a head coaching job in 2020. I could totally see him going to Bill Cowher out moving to the studio, but I don't think it'll be as long as Cowher stayed with the NFL today. Mm-mm. All right. Let's get to the divisional games, gentlemen. We open in with Indianapolis at Kansas City. Kansas City is a five-and-a-half-point favorite. Remember, you are picking this game against the spread. However, it does count straight up as well. Maybe you start us off. Okay. Um, I'm very wary about this pick just because, you know, uh, with how well they've been playing, I have a bad feeling I may be wrong on this. But in Mahomes, I trust Kansas City. Eric. I am so nervous about this pick. I am very nervous about that line. Because what scares me Predictions for that line were between four and five and a half. It opened at five and a half. It has not moved. That bugs me a bit. I want, want to take Kansas City, especially for the reasons I mentioned with Andy Reid. However... I think the Colts, at best, they could pull off the upset, but I really see them covering in this situation. Jason? So Eric's official pick is Indianapolis. Mm Mm-hmm. I'm taking the hot team, Indianapolis Colts. So we all saw that I had kind of a crappy start to my Saturday games last week. I went 0-2 on Saturday. I'm hoping my Saturday predictions continue to be p- crap. I'm picking Kansas City. <laughs> Wait, so you're basically in the reverse boat that I'm in. So I'm you, hoping, 
So you want to be on the island just so you could shut Robert Taylor up. Yes, I want the juju of picking Kansas City, having Indianapolis win, and officially getting rid of Mahomes' time once and for all this season. <laughs> GFR, KC. GFR. Do you know what GFR stands for, Eric? I'm pretty sure you do. I heard GDFR, but... God, see, and I almost set myself up for another D joke. I really need to stop talking. <laughs> Do, do any of you guys know what GFR stands for? Uh, I'm not Good sure. In Good in Oh, okay. There we go. The Saturday 8 o'clock game is Fox Dallas at the Rams. The Rams are laying seven. Brandon? Oof. I I definitely think the Rams are going to win this game, but seven is, uh, I'll, I'll go with my gut and still say the Rams can cover that. Eric. Seven is too big. Pro Cowboy crowd, they playing in the Coliseum, they're not afraid of it, Dallas. And again, it would not surprise me at all if Dallas wins. Jason. Dallas can go to hell. They can get the piss. They can get the piss stopped out of them. Okay. I'm... I'm on the side of Los Angeles here. I think that seven's probably about a right number here. I actually think it might be double digits. I'm going to say 12 officially. I'm going to go with 28-16 and a Rams victory. To Sunday, where the Chargers are at the Patriots, New England is a four-point favorite. Eric? Or, excuse me, sorry. Brandon, you start. You always start these. My what, mistake. What, what was the line? Four to the Patriots. Hmm. Yeah. I I think the, the chart, like I mentioned, this is probably Rivers is one of Rivers' last chance. But um, we all know how the Patriots do in the playoffs. The line is only four. That lo- That seems low to me. Um, yeah, I gotta go with the Patriots here. Eric. While the Los Angeles Chargers are 10 and 0 in games where they've actually had to get on a plane to travel this season, Philip Rivers in his career is 0 and 7 against Tom Brady. One of those O's has to go. And it's going to be that road record. I'm taking the Patriots in this one. I was going to say, the only road loss this year for the Chargers was playing the Rams in Los Angeles. Technically on the road. Mm-hmm. That's why I say 10-0 where they have to get on a plane to travel. Jason? I want to take the Chargers led by Phillip Rivers. I think the Patriots are done. I'm taking the New England Patriots to... (sighs) Can't believe I'm about to say these words. At least two scores. It's a West Coast team coming over to the East Coast for a 1 p.m. start. I don't see it. Mm -hmm. I'm I'm taking the Patriots. To be fair to that, and I think they talked about it on the broadcast last week um, during one of the games. Um, I think because it's the playoffs, I think um, the Chargers traveled early and they've got their clocks more synced up. I still don't like the fact that they're uh, that they're having to play at 1 o'clock. Oh, I agree I with that, that, but... I think this game would have been a lot fairer to the Chargers had this game been played at 4 o'clock on Saturday rather than 1 o'clock on Sunday. Mm-hmm. 
the final game that we will predict this week is Philadelphia heading to New Orleans in the Superdome. It is eight points to the favor of the Saints, Brandon. Um, while I know the Saints are going to be looking to get, you know, back into the Super Bowl and everything, do I think the Eagles will win? Maybe, maybe not, but I definitely think it will be closer than eight. I'm going with the Eagles. Eric. The Eagles specifically said, they got together with Doug Peterson and basically said, burn the tape from the last time these two teams tangled the Superdome. Also, Drew Brees is the only quarterback to beat Nick Foles in the postseason. That game was in the Superdome. Even though they are laying Eight, I think with the inefficiency they had through most of the game in Chicago, I like New Orleans' chances a lot more. Drew Brees' Jesus will resurrect with a little voodoo help in New Orleans. Jason. Give me the Saints. Care to expand upon that or just taking the thing? I'm barely awake right now. <laughs> All right. Well, then let's go ahead and wrap this up here so that way Jason can go to bed. Too much time spent watching the I, I'm movie. pretty sure I'm, I'm pretty sure that I fell asleep like three times during this show. You may have. I did hear snoring a little bit ago. It might have been you. No, I've, I've had my mic muted every time I fell asleep. Well, that's good. Uh, I'm in the same boat as Brandon on this one, and I hate to say that, but literally the exact same boat. Saints win, Fal- or excuse me, not Falcon, wrong bird. <laughs> Saints win, <laughs> Eagles cover. I'll take Philadelphia officially, but I do think New Orleans wins probably probably by like four or five. Great minds think alike. Greater minds let Jason go to bed, so... <laughs> Fair and then the greatest minds think for themselves. Where can people find you well, online? Then, at, at elim- that eliminates Bisco because he steals all of our ideas two days after we post them. <laughs> I did no such thing this week. He did no such thing this week. I will give him credit for that. Jason, where can people find, <laughs> find you online? In my bed asleep. <laughs> they can find me. They can find me taking naps because I'm 40 and I'm a man. But if you ever want to tweet me, it's at Turkey Glue 822 on Twitter. I'm pretty sure I'll offend you at some point. Oh. Mm-hmm. Eric, where can and people we find just you there real quick. I was about to say, did we lose you there? But uh, <laughs> uh-huh. at, Squid, at Squid Sports Head on Twitter, we, we did finally do a new episode of Soccer to the Max here on the W2M Network. Uh, football to the Max? Question marks point of viewer maybe a couple fewer question marks uh football to the max you have the kickoff you need not worry yeah we do it better yeah hey, you don't want to hear me droning on about the blitzing cross blocks and crossing routes <laughs> brandon when you're not stealing people's stuff where can people find you online uh, they can find me on Twitter at Bisco underscore Gotham SN and uh, hopefully soon here back with some wrestling uh, content. Talk to talk to Cedric. I told will you. Do. Cedric's willing to do Raw. I'm still willing to do SmackDown. I will not review Raw twice in a week. I won't do that. Oh, no, myself. of course. You, you don't want to put yourself through that torture. It, it's hard enough to review it once a week at times. Trust me. I'm online at H-E-B the Eagle, H-E-B-T-H-E-E-A-G-L-E. In addition, you can find me on 
the Chair Shot Radio Network, where I host the Raw Reaction every Monday night at 11.30 p.m. with Tony Acero and Andrew Ballas. I also do reviews for the Chair Shot Radio Network for the website at thechairshot.com, where later this week I will be reviewing TNA, Impact Wrestling, call them what you want to, their homecoming pay-per-view from this past Sunday, January 6th. For Jason Teasley, Eric Watkins, and Brandon Biscubing, I'm Harry Broadhurst, thanking you for listening to the kickoff, a presentation of the W2M Network, online at w2mnet.com, and available in all of your favorite podcast listening devices, such as iTunes, iHeartRadio, Stitcher, Spreaker, Podbean, CastBox. Hey, Eric, Eric, guess what? Spotify is here. And a human centipede lives. <laughs> Jason, you're a dick. Thanks for listening, everybody. We're out.